We're coming on the air this Black Friday with a look at how shoppers are handling the busy crowds and the higher prices. Why people are spending just as much as last year, even though their dollar doesn't quite go as far. And more shoppers than ever before are buying holiday presents at home. Plus, Team USA is controlling its own destiny after a tie with England just in the last few minutes. A look at the Americans' winner-take-all match on Tuesday, plus a few key college football games, too. And in our original, the recreational marijuana business in New York is in limbo. Why people who want to start their own cannabis shops say a delay in getting their licenses approved is setting them back. Plus, in our backstory, we get the behind-the-scenes look on the crypto collapse, how it took just a week for FTX founder Sam Bankman frieds world to come crashing down. And reality TV seems to be a foolproof way to overnight stardom, but that stardom can come at a hefty price. What psychologists are saying later in the show. Hey everyone, I'm Lindsay in for Hallie, and across the country, millions of Americans are wrapping up a busy day of shopping, but their bags probably are a little bit lighter because a buck just doesn't go as far. Experts expect the average household will buy about $1,400 worth of stuff this holiday season. That's pretty much in line with last year. But remember, with inflation nearing 8%, you're simply not getting as much. The average household is spending $433 bucks more a month for everything because of inflation. And buyers definitely feel the pinch. Because of inflation, we're absolutely not able to spend as much as we have in the past. That's not keeping people home. The National Retail Federation predicts nearly half of Americans, 166 million, will hit the stores between Thanksgiving and Monday. And people are getting a jump start. Shoppers spent more than $5 billion online on Thanksgiving alone. That's a 3% jump from last year and more than twice of a typical day of shopping. Our economy expert, Brian Chung, is at the Garden State Plaza in Paramus, New Jersey. So, Brian, got to ask you, how have the crowds been? We have seen those viral videos of people pushing and shoving to get out. What's it looking like there today? Yeah, well, I mean, the days of the door busters are not really a thing anymore. In fact, some retailers here at the Garden State Plaza Mall didn't even open up until 9 a.m. Some of that could just be the fact of e-commerce entering the fold here. But look, at the end of the day, the kind of elephant in the room in this mall is the 7.7 percent inflation that has made everything more expensive. But nonetheless, that hasn't stopped people from getting to the mall and getting to the mall early today. Take a listen to uh, some folks that I spoke to earlier today about their approach to this Black Friday. When do you get started shopping at uh, GSP this morning? Seven. Seven. The deals are okay. I think some stores have better deals. Tell me about the haul. Um, so this is my daughter's, my daughter-in-law, and my sister's. And I am the person that goes back and forth to the car. <laughs> so you can see some people juggling a lot of bags, so clearly not stopping some Americans from going out and balling out this holiday season. But again, the overall picture shows that the average American, according to Lloyd, is spending about $1,400 this year. That's about the same as last year. And with inflation, that means that might stretch across fewer gifts this year, people being a little bit choosier over who might be getting something under the tree this holiday season, Lindsay. Are there any signs, too, that people might actually be waiting to see, okay, the deals today, they're not as good as maybe I was hoping or expecting, maybe come December when stores try to push things out or maybe I get an extra check, uh, people will be doing their shopping then. That is certainly the case, and that's because of the fact that Black Friday is no longer the only day where you're getting discounts. For what it's worth, a lot of these retailers started their online discounting earlier this week, and they're going to continue those discounts through the weekend and into Cyber Monday. So the impulse to buy specifically on Friday and then in person might not be there as much in 2022 as it was about 10 years ago. But there's a few tips that I spoke with experts about that said, look, if you're trying to buy things like winter boots, for example, now is not the time to buy that because guess what? It's cold and everyone wants winter boots. Maybe wait until after the new year to get things like that. It depends on what you're shopping for. Strategize before you go out there and spend. All right, don't you go too crazy over there. Brian Chung, thank you. I'll try not to. <laughs> all right, for those of you scrolling through social media today, I am sure you have seen Black Friday sales all over your accounts. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, even YouTube. I got sucked into one on Insta today. And it probably won't surprise you that those who are doing the most holiday shopping on social media this year are Gen Z, almost two-thirds. CNBC's Julia Borston is here to break down the impact these holiday ads have on the platforms. 
MetaSnap and YouTube are all struggling with an advertising contraction, and they see social shopping as a key opportunity to lock in e-commerce advertisers and ultimately to diversify their revenue streams. 34% of shoppers say they plan to do holiday shopping on social media this year. That's up from 28% last year and 26% in 2020, according to a survey by Deloitte. That's projected to drive social commerce sales to $958 billion this year, up from $732 billion last year. Meta is offering advertisers more AI-driven tools to help them create shopping ads. Those tools, Meta says, help drive a 30% higher return on investment. Meanwhile, Snap continues to focus on augmented reality. It has a new AI-driven AR shopping tool, which uses a bot to ask Snapchatters questions about the person they're shopping for. Then, with voice-based machine learning, this bot shows custom gift ideas, which, of course, consumers can then buy. And YouTube is expanding the shopping capabilities in Shorts, which is its TikTok short-form video rival. Now, Meta and Snap are not taking a cut of commerce right now, but they are investing in these tools to drive advertiser and consumer engagement, while YouTube plans to take a percentage of creators' affiliate sales. All right, Julia, thank you. So after all that shopping and leftovers eating, you may be traveling back home. We've been telling you all week that it was relatively seamless travel ahead of Thanksgiving, but it might not be as smooth this weekend. The travel this year was high. More than 3.8 million people went through airports Wednesday and Thursday. That's a little more than 90 percent of 2019. AAA estimates almost 49 million people are traveling by car. So with everyone having to get back home, weather could impact travel plans in the south and in the east. So let's first get to Ron Allen at New York's LaGuardia Airport. And Ron, I know you were pleasantly surprised by how things were looking uh, yesterday, uh, everything going pretty smoothly. How's it looking today? Well, you know, more of the same, Lindsay. It's, 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 it's been a remarkably great couple of days to travel. And, you know, the numbers across the country kind of bear that out. Here at LaGuardia, we have seen very few cancellations. You can see behind me here, there's there was a more traffic earlier in the day and, and now it's sort of waned again and you know it might pick up later this evening as people are kind of winding down the day and trying to get back home before the rush that everybody expects to happen on Sunday but it seems that you know the airlines TSA have kind of figured this out and we're not seeing any of the chaos that we saw during the spring and summer the numbers from flight aware suggest that there have only been a handful of cancellations and delays across the country all day today. The numbers were similar yesterday. And when you look at those numbers, consider the fact that there are about 45,000 flights on any given day. Uh, here's what some of the travelers that we've been talking to have been saying about their experience. Take a listen. My semester ends next week. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to finish. I'm hoping by me tra traveling today, there's less people around, but people are always traveling. So just be safe. Hopefully smooth travel, no delays, and straight flight home. I'm surprised the airport doesn't look more busier than it already is. It doesn't, really. It's, it's you know, we're just looking at one airport, one terminal in amongst many across the country, but uh, this is not the chaos that we, some may have expected. It's, it's been relatively smooth. The TSA uh, put on extra staff. You know, the airlines have been trying to figure this out. They were anticipating and concerned about uh, the chaos that happened during the travel season in the spring and summer. That's not happening. So it's been a good holiday to travel. But again, the big test will come Sunday, which is always one of the busiest travel days of the year. Uh, the numbers so far, as you saw earlier, bear out that this travel holiday season is not is not where it was in 2019. Those numbers from 2019 are for a typical uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday period. We haven't seen numbers compared to the holiday seasons of past. But again, more people are out there, more people are traveling. It seems to be going well. Let's not jinx it. And let's hope it just keeps on going well. <laughs> Lindsay, yeah, that's a great you. idea. You know, I missed a flight once and never again. Now I'm always there two hours ahead of time, even if it means I am bored stiff at the gate. Um, it's great advice. All right, Ron, thanks so much. Let's bring in meteorologist Michelle Grossman to give us the latest on how the weather is going to impact travel this holiday weekend. So, Michelle, yesterday we saw some beautiful weather for Thanksgiving. I mean, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, it was like 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but what can we expect uh, uh, really for the remainder of Black Friday? Some showers and storms, right?
Yeah, we do have some showers and storms. Hi there, Lindsay. And I know this week has been so picture perfect in terms of the weather. It's so rare. I think collectively, you and I have probably worked a lot of Thanksgivings. And it seems like there's always these cross-country storms. We didn't have it this week. We will see some storms come Sunday as well. So let's talk about tonight first, because a lot of people on the roadways, too, traveling back and forth to see some friends. And we're looking relatively quiet through the southwest and northern and central plains, the Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes. We started out with some showers in the northeast, also the mid-Atlantic. Those have cleared out. That's a cold front that moved off the coast. But you can see still some wintry weather in portions of New England. The tail end of that cold front brings some showers to the southeast. It's really the southern plains, though, that's been the bullseye for some really strong weather. We had severe storms last night. We had the potential for severe storms tonight. So as we look on radar here, we're looking at some heavy rain in portions of the southern plains through Texas, also through uh, portions of Louisiana, at least just touching the coast there. Where you see those brighter colors, that's where we're seeing the heaviest rain falling. On the cold side, of the system, we're seeing some snow. So where you see blue, that's in far western Texas, also New Mexico. We could see up to a foot of snow before it's all said and done tomorrow. We're also looking at the potential for a lot of rain, especially in portions of Texas, the Gulf Coast states, into the lower Mississippi Valley. That's tonight and tomorrow. And then through Sunday, when the system moves off to the north and east, we're going to see some rain on Sunday in the northeast. We'll talk about that in just a bit. But we do have 7 million people impacted by flood alerts tonight, overnight, into early tomorrow morning. That includes Houston, into Galveston, uh, also uh, portions south of Galveston, where we're looking at some heavy rain falling, winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. We could see some heavy storms as well. Could see some hail, the chance of a few supercells, a few isolated tornadoes as it moves on shore. And then we do have winter alerts, where you see the pink, that is a winter storm warning, heavy snow, winds gusting up to 35 miles per hour. And we could see up to a foot of snow in some spots, where you see the pinks and the purples, that's the highest amount, uh, equaling up to a foot. Lindsay? So, Michelle, uh, we keep talking about travel and how nice it's been, and then there's tr people trying to get home, and we say weather might impact. Yeah. What are we looking at? Yeah, so let's go ahead and look towards this weekend. So we're looking at tomorrow. We're looking at a storm system developing the southern plains once again. So that's going to be another tricky spot. So we're going to be watching that very closely. Again, could see another round of severe weather tomorrow night. Uh, showers are going to be lingering across uh, portions of Texas into New Mexico. And then as we go throughout time here, pleasant conditions in the northeast and New England area into the southeast. That's great news if you're flying out tomorrow. Big hubs there looking really good. Chicago looking good. So the Midwest, the Great Lakes, parts of the Ohio Valley that Heavy rain still falling in portions of the southern plains. Mountain snow, so Salt Lake City, you could be impacted as well if you're traveling out of that hub there. Then as we look towards Sunday, Ron had mentioned this, a busy, busy day. Lots of people trying to get home, ending their holiday before they work on Monday. And we're looking at a wall of rain moving into portions of the northeast, into the mid-Atlantic. You can see those bright colors once again. The yellows, the reds, the oranges, that's indicating where some heavy rain could fall. And that's why we're in anticipating the chance for some delays. So tomorrow, again, looking good along the East Coast. Possible delays in Dallas, Houston, also Salt Lake City. It's on Sunday, though. This is going to be a big day. I'm going to be on our sister station on MSNBC on Sunday, kind of following the weather that day, because we're looking at likely impacts for Boston, New York City, Philadelphia, D.C. You probably want to get there ahead of time, check your schedule uh, to make sure your flight is still taking off. And we're looking at possible delays also in Detroit and also Chicago. Lindsay, so some big hubs being impacted on Sunday. Okay, we'll watch for you on Sunday. Michelle, thanks so much. Great. Today, we are learning about the youngest victim in the mass shooting at a Virginia Walmart where six people were killed. Authorities now releasing the name and photo of a 16-year-old boy who was killed. Chesapeake police say it's with great sadness that we confirm Fernando Chavez Barone was the juvenile victim in this tragedy. And this announcement comes as detectives are also getting new insight into the shooter after searching the gunman's home and finding his phone with a chilling note in it. In the note, the gunman, who was a longtime Walmart employee, talks about how he believed his coworkers were laughing at him and talking about him. All of these new revelations come just a day after we heard President Biden say he's ready to renew his push to ban assault-style rifles. Speaking on Thanksgiving, the president said he'd try and press for the ban in the congressional lame duck session when outgoing lawmakers who aren't facing another election might feel less pressure and be more apt to support something like this. Cal Perry joins me now. So, Cal, a vigil for the victims of the shooting will be on Monday. What's the feeling there on the ground today, especially with this latest revelation of that 16-year-old's identity? I think people are still shocked. Um, but at the same time, look, everybody we talk to... Um, 
is no longer surprised by mass shootings, especially here in the state of Virginia. There have been a number of high-profile ones recently, so people are just starting to try to come to terms with what's happened. We're also getting new details on the gun, and, and that's what people are talking about a lot here today. The gun was bought the morning of the shooting by the gunman, a handgun from a nearby store, um, and it was done so legally. So it's not clear to people here, and as we look towards this vigil on Monday, it's not clear um, how anyone could have stopped this shooting. When you look at that note uh, that was left by the gunman, found by police in his phone, uh, it was clear in that note who he wanted to kill, um, and he, with some cold accuracy, horrifically carried out those killings, Lindsay. Cal, uh, talking about that note, we know Chesapeake police were trying to piece together a motive here. Um, the note reveals a lot. Yeah, and you talked about some of it. It was a highly paranoid note at times. Uh, the gunman saying at one point in the note that he thought maybe his phone had been tapped. Um, he asked for forgiveness at the end of the note, an indication, um, I guess, that he knew what, what he was about to do um, was beyond horrific. Um, but the, the core of the note, and I, I think what authorities uh, were hoping to do when they released it, was provide some insight about why he targeted who he targeted. As you said, he, he lashed out at his, at his co-workers in that note saying uh, that they were laughing at him that they were mocking him, uh, they were calling him names, they were talking about him behind um, his back. Um, and so it was clearly a, a targeted act of mass murder. Uh, you know, all six of those who died worked in the Walmart, including that 16-year-old who was a temporary worker. And we should update the condition of, of two people. One person still in serious condition at a nearby hospital, and one person had their condition today, thankfully, upgraded, Lindsay. Okay. Cal Perry, thank you. Right now, Apple says they're reviewing the situation at Foxconn, their iPhone supplier factory in China, as we're seeing videos of major worker protests make the rounds on social media. Clips like this, chaotic scenes and fighting at a place where most of the world's iPhones are made. One worker telling NBC News that anger has been growing over how COVID cases are being handled under China's zero COVID policy of lockdowns, quarantines and forced testing more than two years into the pandemic. Because of this strategy, a lot of people in China have never even been exposed to COVID, which means a huge swath of people don't have natural immunity. Just yesterday, China set a new record of more than 31,600 new cases as they try to deal with what could be the biggest outbreak yet. Janice Mackey Freyer has more from Beijing. China's government had tried tweaking its tough zero COVID policy to help the economy here. But with cases now at a record high, they're bearing down again with quarantines, lockdowns and mandatory testing. And consumers in the U.S. are going to feel it, especially people wanting iPhones. After protests this week at Apple's main supplier in Zhengzhou, boiled over chaotic scenes at the huge Foxconn factory campus that's making most of the world's iPhones. Video showing workers clashing with police wearing hazmat suits. According to workers, the protests were sparked by a pay dispute as well as COVID rules at the plant, which has been locked down for weeks. Most of the people protesting were new hires recruited after an exodus from the factory ahead of the lockdown last month. Now, Foxconn has issued a statement apologizing and it's offering bonuses to new workers who want to quit. And that's posing a major disruption to Apple's production ahead of a busy holiday shopping season. Delivery times for iPhones will be impacted, too, because the city where the factory is located is also under lockdown. Now, in a statement to NBC News, Apple says it has team members on the ground, adding, we're reviewing the situation and working closely with Foxconn to ensure their employees' concerns are addressed. Apple had already warned earlier this month of lower output because of the lingering problems there. Foxconn now confirms it's giving $1,400 severance to any of those new hires who want to leave. And that is posing a fresh setback ahead of what should be a busy retail season for Apple. Well, as we were walking in the studio, Team USA walked off the pitch with control of its own destiny. The Americans tying England 0-0 no score. And that's a huge result. Why? Because earlier today, Iran took down Wales 2-0, a huge upset. And one that came with some controversy, too, because the Iranian players sang the national anthem today after appearing not to do so in their first game. Our Tehran Bureau says they were definitely under pressure from the government. 
Telemundo sports anchor Carlos Eustis is in Doha. So, Carlos, catch us up on some of these uh, big upsets in these games. How are you, Lindsay? Good evening from Doha. Uh, yeah, I mean, the result from Iran actually made things really complicated for the USA because now the only result they can get on Tuesday when they face this team is a win. That's it. They cannot afford to lose any points if they want to make it to the second round, something that is really important for the team, given that this is their first participation in eight years after they didn't make it to Russia 2018. So for the U.S., after facing what they saw today with a really low block and basically defending against England, they're going to have to go all out. They have to try to make those weapons that they have with these youngsters work for the team and we'll see if they can get the result. So now every team has played at least one game. Who's looking like the early favorite in the tournament and what team are you most surprised by? That's a two prong. Well, I, I think the, the biggest the biggest rival to beat in this FIFA World Cup is Brazil. Even if, even before it started and after we saw them, the quality of their players, the, the stars that they have, it's a really cohesive team that has moved along a, a a, away from what the Joe Bonito was, and they're, they're moving, being a little more offensive and a little more effective, and they're being able to get their results. Then there's a the team of Spain, which is the complete opposite. It's a really young team with a lot of stars that are just emerging, 18, 19 year olds like Gavi, um, but they're really well coached by Luis Enrique. So to me, they're the second favorite. And the third one, I still will put England, regardless of how they look today. They were able to put six goals past Iran. Uh, they also have a really young team that has been able to win the World Cup at the U-17 and the U-20 level, and they're still getting together. And then obviously we'll see it tomorrow, but Argentina has to be in that group, and we'll see if Germany can also pull it off after losing to Japan, which is one of the surprises along with Saudi Arabia. Take us to the ground. What's the energy like? It's been fantastic. I mean, you see it here. We're in the Pearl. It's a, it's a, it's an area that was built basically for the tournament. And little by little, a lot of fans have been coming in. Um, we have a really big contingency with fans from Argentina and Mexico, which will clash tomorrow at the Los Ailes Stadium. And it seems to be like a really big energy. Um, there's a market known as the Sukwa Keef, where there's a lot of people going from all over the place. So little by little, as we, we stayed here in the tournament, we saw that there's that vibe of World Cup moving on in the tournament. All right, Carlos Eustis, thank you. Still to come, Mexican authorities say they want an American extradited on charges in another tourist's death. What we know about how she died and the people she was traveling with. Plus, another new plan for Twitter getting decided by one of Elon Musk's polls. Who could be let back on the site and who's getting verified next? NASA has released some amazing new close-up pictures of the moon's surface. We're going to show you to them in our five things. But first, Elon Musk saying today that Twitter plans to relaunch its premium service that gives out verified check marks to official celebrities and organizations. So if you remember, they tried this once earlier this month, having users pay $8 for a verified blue check mark. But then they had to pause it because accounts sprang up impersonating companies, athletes, politicians. So under the new plan, companies get a gold check mark, governments get a gray check mark, and people who pay money, regardless of celebrity status, will get that blue check. Musk had also posted a Twitter poll asking whether the platform should allow suspended accounts to come back. And nearly three quarters of responses said yes. Joining me right now is Guad Venegas. So Guad, let's start with this premium service here. They had some issues with the first launch and accounts doing these impersonations. What's different this time? Uh, Lindsay, well, first off, the colors, right? So now we have different colors to identify governments, uh, corporations, and then, of course, uh, individuals. Now, we know that this service could begin as early as December 2nd. Uh, Elon Musk has been sharing details on Twitter, uh, but he is saying that more details will be revealed next week. So when it comes to those individual accounts, which are getting the most attention, he's also said that next to that blue check mark, there could be a mark associating that individual to a an organization. So essentially people that work for a news organization could have their name, the check mark, and then the logo of the company. This after that becomes verified. Now the verification process, which is also a question, uh, Elon Musk has said that would be manually authenticated, which is very important because we know how difficult it can be to make sure that these accounts are in fact associated to an individual. But then of course you have other questions like staff. With all of the staff changes, uh, one can 
can question if Twitter will have enough people to manually authenticate all of these accounts. Those are some of the details that we have learned. Of course, once again, uh, Elon Musk has said that next week he will be revealing more information on this new service. That's such an important point. Who is going to manually do all this checking? So, Guad, Musk is also using Twitter polls to make major decisions about the company, reviving banned accounts after nearly 3 million Twitter accounts voted in his poll. But Musk tweeted, as we've been on the air, that inciting violence will result in a suspended account. And Kanye West, for example, is now using his unrestricted account to announce a 2024 run for president, tweeting hashtag ye2024. Yet safety experts are still raising a red flag here. Um, Want to talk to you about some of these controversies here and, and sort of what we're seeing about the future here um, and some of these big decisions being made on polls, seemingly. Uh, Lindsay, as you mentioned, he just tweeted minutes ago, giving more details. So a lot of this information is being revealed as we speak. Uh, first of all, when it comes to Elon Musk, we have to understand that uh, there's no press releases going out. Uh, a lot of these are tweets where he's answering questions from users on Twitter. It's not even him just tweeting that. It's him answering questions. So you have to fish for some of this information or, or pay attention, of course. So when it comes to these bots, Twitter polls are known for being vulnerable to these bots, according to experts. So the question is, we know that he used the poll first to bring back Donald Trump's account and now to announce that these banned accounts will be coming back to Twitter. Uh, are these votes, these more than 3 million votes that answered that poll, are they specific individuals or are they bots? That's one of the questions that the experts have. And then uh, some more information that Elon Musk shared in the tweet where he informed that these accounts would be unbanned is that that uh, he would not unban accounts of people that had broken the law or those that had been engaged in egregious spam. But what does this exactly mean? So as people begin asking questions, he's answering some of those, and that's how he's now tweeted, uh, as you mentioned, that people that are involved in inciting to violence will result with their account being suspended as Twitter begins to unban, unban some of these accounts. And then when you look at what Elon Musk has tweeted, uh, breaking the law, the laws are different in every country. So how is this going to affect the company? For example, in Europe, the European Union is much more strict on social media companies and the control that they must have over the content that they have on their platforms. So it's going to be different. And then, of course, you've got hate speech, right, that necessarily doesn't break a law and is not spam. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, at what point are you inciting to violence? So these are all the determinations that will have to be made by a team at Twitter. And who is going to be a part of that team? These are the questions that people have as this announcement is made, Lindsay. All right, Guad Venegas, thank you so much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about right now. Number one, bird flu has wiped out more than 50 million birds in the U.S. this year. That's according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's the country's deadliest outbreak in history and the worst animal health disaster in the U.S. to date. The loss of so many sent prices for eggs and turkey to record highs. Number two, police say a Pennsylvania man has been arrested after TSA officers stopped him with a loaded gun in his carry-on bag at Newark Airport in New Jersey yesterday. Officials say he's the third person to be arrested there this month for having guns in their bags. Number three, Ford is recalling more than 634,000 Bronco Sport and Escape SUVs worldwide, specifically the 2020 through 2023 model years. Why? Because of fire risks from a possible crack in the fuel injector. Ford has gotten reports of about 20 fires, but it's not recommending that owners stop driving them because they say the fires are rare. Repairs aren't yet available, but once they are, a Ford rep says owners should schedule service with the dealer. Number four, German police say hundreds of ancient gold coins dating back to around 100 BC have been stolen from a museum. Officials say the thieves got in and out of the museum in just nine minutes. A German news agency reported that the coins are estimated to be worth several million euros. And one concern a lot of archeologists have is that someone will just come and melt down the coins for the value of the gold itself, which is only about 250,000 euros. Number five, look at these new gorgeous images from NASA snapped by the Orion spacecraft earlier this week as it cruised about 80 miles above the moon. The pictures Orion has been taking 
of both the moon and the Earth will help spacecraft orientation during future crewed missions. Remember, this is all part of NASA's plan to send humans back to the lunar surface. Well, Mexican prosecutors have filed charges against an American woman suspected of killing a 25-year-old North Carolina woman in Cabo San Lucas last month. They're not releasing the suspect's name, but are working to extradite her back to Mexico to face charges. Shanquilla Robinson died less than 24 hours after she got to Mexico for a vacation with a group of six friends. Robinson's family says her friends claimed she died from alcohol poisoning, but the autopsy report shows Robinson's neck was broken and her spinal cord was cracked. NBC News has not verified that report. Joining me right now is Stephen Romo. Stephen, what do we know about this arrest warrant? Yeah, Lindsay, this family has just been through so much. And even with that warrant, there are still a lot of questions. Like you mentioned, there's no name on the warrant. But Mexican officials are saying it's for the person likely responsible for Robinson's death. The warrant also indicates that this was not an accident, but was a purposeful attack. Some comfort to the family and all the advocates who've been pushing for justice in this case to know that the justice system, at least in Mexico, is working. We also know the FBI is investigating this case as well. So it's unclear right now when that person could be extradited back to Mexico to possibly face the charges for this. It's also unclear if there could be any other charges in this case going forward, Lindsay. The Robinsons uh, family really giving a lot of credit to social media for shining a spotlight on Chanquilla's death, right? Yeah, this is uh, one thing we cannot overlook about this case. It really has been primarily black content creators who've been pushing this message forward. They've been using the Say Her Name hashtag, posting about this since word first broke of her death. And the family is crediting them with that, saying that there have been videos posted that purportedly show part of a beating that may have happened there. We have not been able to independently verify that, so we're not sharing it. But it is one of the things that people have been using to keep attention on this, something that her family has said they are grateful for and crediting them with really getting the wheels of justice turning on this case, something we're going to continue to follow. Lindsay. Stephen Romo, thank you so much. Thanks. When we come back, we're talking to a reporter who's been covering crypto, the FTX crash, and the wild characters behind it. That's our backstory tonight. Stay with us. From overnight fame to online backlash, there are real mental impacts for some contestants on reality TV shows. What psychologists are saying later this hour. But first, it's time to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And today, crypto exchange platform Binance just set aside another billion dollars toward its industry recovery fund. So that's basically money to try and support the crypto industry overall because it's had a monumental crash these last few weeks. A number of firms have gone bankrupt, including digital currency exchange FTX. Well, the company, along with its 30-year-old founder, Sam Bankman-Fried, had become so popular, and then between celebrity endorsements and big sponsorships, FTX was pretty much everywhere. But in less than a week, it all got wiped out, and Bankman-Fried stepped down. Well, the team of reporters at New York Magazine decided to look into it from all angles, and they reported on everything from the founder's background as the son of two Stanford law professors to the ins and outs of his luxury lifestyle in the Bahamas. Kevin Dugan was one of those reporters, and he joins me now. So, Kevin, Bankman-Fried... Pretty unique figure. How do you approach reporting on a big character like him when there are so many other journalists trying to do the same thing and get access? Sure. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, he is bigger than life in a lot of ways. And that means that he has met with so many people over so many years. Um, being a person who had access to billions of dollars, who had access to people not only in crypto, but on Wall Street, meant that there were a lot of people who knew him, who had business with him, or who looked into having business with him. So um, there have been a lot of people who have been willing to talk um, although there are many others now who are less willing, perhaps because there is a uh, you know, criminal investigation going on right now. And you've covered this for months. You've been to the Bahamas. You've spent quite a bit of time there as part of this. Is there anything you think the media should or could have done differently in reporting on all this in the past year now that hindsight's 2020? 
Absolutely. There were, uh, there's at least uh, one lawsuit that uh, accused uh, Sam Bankman Freed's hedge fund, Alameda Research, of market manipulation. And there was another uh, accusation on a blog post by a crypto company that made a similar accusation of market manipulation. These were things that were dropped, um, never really went too far, uh, but they do point to where things are now. And so those are those are two kind of canaries in the coal mine, I would say, that uh, should have been followed up on and, and dug into deeper. Before I ask you how you write about this so that readers can understand. What's the biggest takeaway for us to learn of this whole debacle so far that, by the way, is still unfolding? Right. So it is still going on. And this is a giant uh, alleged fraud, right? I mean, it, he has not been uh, indicted. He has not been charged with any crimes yet. But um, I think the biggest takeaway here is that um, the the size and the speed at which he, Sam Bankman-Fried was able to accumulate his money and his power is exactly what has made him so suspicious. And so in uh, evaluating the rest of the crypto economy, um, those people who have been able to pass themselves off as legitimate or vetted, uh, they should probably be uh, given the same level of skepticism that we think of Sam Beckman now. Ah, important point. All right. I only have 30 seconds with you on this one. I wish we had more time. But how do you break this down because it's so complicated so that readers fully get the picture and understand what's going on? This is a classic bank run, um, except that there is, uh, you know, Beckman Freed was able to borrow from his own bank and then lend that money out to his own companies. So um, it's it's the the fundamentals of it are very simple. Uh, he ran out of money, and um, it's just crypto money that makes it feel a little bit complicated. Kevin Dugan, um, much less complicated now that we've been able to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And coming up in our original, New York State has started approving licenses to sell recreational marijuana. Only a fraction of applicants got approved. Why that's the case and why the future of the industry in the Big Apple remains uncertain. Plus, an incredible story of survival. The Coast Guard says it rescued a man from the Gulf of Mexico a day after he fell overboard from a cruise ship. What we know in the local. Now we want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. New York has approved the first licenses to sell recreational marijuana in the state. But of the more than 900 applications the state received, only 36 were approved. And now the entire issue is tied up in the courts because earlier this month, a federal judge essentially stopped license approval in certain parts of New York. NBC's Zinkley Esamwa has a story. Legal cannabis dispensaries are coming to New York. We've been doing education around the state for the last year. Right? The state's Cannabis Control Board approving the first marijuana retail dispensary licenses on Monday to individuals with prior marijuana convictions. The cannabis law is first and foremost a mandate for truth, reconciliation, and restorative justice. It's meant to create a market for legal recreational marijuana, but the rollout has been difficult for some. Of the whopping 900 applicants, just over 30 licenses were issued. How does it feel not having gotten a license? I mean, it feels a little bit discouraging, but still hopeful. Some clarity in the, the entire process maybe would have taken some of the sting away. In August, I met Cost Marte and team shortly after applications for the conditional adult use retail dispensary or card program were released. And the other big thing that Cost every he dreams of launching Conbud with founders to sell cannabis just steps away from where he was first arrested for it. What difference would this license make for your company? Being arrested multiple times for cannabis and now having the opportunity to sell it, it would have been a dream. For now, it's a dream deferred. For the applicants that are still waiting to hear back from us, we've got a uh, couple more board meetings coming up. Damian Fagan, the chief equity officer for New York's Office of Cannabis Management, or OCM, tells us they don't plan to cap the number of licenses. And the next round of licensees may be announced in December. 
all as legal challenges ensue. In early November, a federal judge issuing an injunction temporarily blocking license approval in some parts of New York. OCM declined to comment on the litigation. Still, others in the supply chain are hoping to join distribution. We're allowed to grow up to 30,000 square feet of flowering cannabis canopy. Oswad King Sally and Jasmine Burems grow cannabis in Copake, New York. They have an adult use conditional cultivator license. They can leave legally grow in the state, but hope to also one day distribute. In the interim, they're focusing on selling to the newly minted distributors. As all of the dispensaries are being named and listed to open now, now we begin the conversation of placing our product in all of the dispensaries. All as prospects like Marte share their hopes to legally join the cannabis market. I hope they make that next announcement and and tell us Combud LLC uh, has been awarded. Now, Lindsay, as I mentioned, the next round of license awardees will hear back in December. And while that is close to the end of the year, New York's Office of Cannabis Management tells me the first retail store should be open by 2023. Back to you. Think Clay, thanks so much. Well, NBC covers hundreds of stories each day, and because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. So this is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, the Coast Guard rescued a man from the Gulf of Mexico Thanksgiving night after he went missing from a cruise ship the night before. The man was found about 20 miles off the Louisiana coast and needed emergency medical services. The Coast Guard says he was last reported to be in stable condition. Officials say they're beyond grateful for the positive outcome. No word on who he is yet. Also from our Southeast Bureau, the teenager shot by a San Antonio police officer in a McDonald's parking lot early last month has been released from the hospital. Eric Cantu's parents say he still has a long road to recovery, but they're overjoyed with his progress. He was placed on life support after being shot by an officer who was there on an unrelated call. That officer has been fired, arrested, and charged with two counts of aggravated assault. From our Northeast Bureau, two more buses carrying about 80 migrants arrived in Philadelphia from Texas this morning. They're said to be mainly from Colombia, Nicaragua, and the Dominican Republic. Volunteers met them and handed out blankets, food, and water before they were taken to a nearby shelter. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has been sending migrants to that city and others, and he says it's meant to highlight Washington's inaction on immigration. Critics have called his moves a political stunt. Well, are you a reality TV junkie? If you are, you probably saw the big season finale of Bachelor in Paradise this week with the storybook ending everyone was hoping for. So that's what reality TV is all about, right? The happily ever after, winning the big prize in the end. And while participating in these shows can bring overnight fame with thousands of new Instagram followers, sometimes it's not all it's cracked up to be. It can bring about huge amounts of criticism, of course, social media trolling. Experts who have worked with contestants on reality TV shows say the mental health impacts are real. Participants are either unable to handle their newfound fame or they go on the show expecting to become a star only to find themselves disappointed. Joining me right now is Dr. Akshay Sayal. So Dr. Sayal, the experts you talk to say it's really what happens after the show, in the real world, when these issues start. Is that right? Yeah, good evening, Lindsay. You know, the experts I've talked to have worked on these shows and have dealt with, you know, what these contestants are really going through. Um, and yeah, so, you know, the, if you think about what makes reality TV entertaining, it's it's the unknown. It's it's the, all the drama that goes on set and the, and the sort of animosity there. And, you know, those things aren't, you can imagine, not good for somebody's mental health. Um, and the issue is, you know, if you if you have something like that that affects your mental health, and then you take time and you process it, you get over it, these contestants have to relive that months or weeks later when these when these segments re-air. So yeah, they really draw attention to the sort of after the filming and what happens after that, to your point. I mean, then there's the negativity that the contestants get from people on social media. But do you think a lot of that is stemmed from the way it's edited? I mean, producers essentially looking for heroes and villains to keep things interesting? Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it kind of goes back to that sort of the unknown and then all the drama behind the reality TV. But, you know, the one thing they really point out to me is when you take somebody who's, you know, just an ordinary person and you, and you give them, a, you know, a verified Instagram account with hundreds of thousands of followers overnight, 
they kind of become accustomed to a certain a certain lifestyle and a certain level of success that may not always carry through after the show is over. And so, you know, those experts who work on those shows tell me that's something that if it doesn't pan out for them, really does hit them a little bit harder than you would think. What about our obsession with reality TV? Because a lot of us, we go home after a long day, we pop some popcorn, and it's just kind of mindless. You veg out, and we're watching to make ourselves feel better, but sometimes you feel kind of crummy after you watch. Yeah, you know, the, the solution here isn't to get rid of reality TV. I do think there's some positives here. Like you said, it's after a long day of work, it's something that's quite easy to watch, honestly. Um, so, you know, yeah, there are a lot of reasons why we like TV and one of them, reality TV, and one of them being, you know, it does make us, unfortunately, sometimes feel better about ourselves when you see these characters say these uh, outlandish, ridiculous things. It, it can make you feel better. Um, but, you know, the solution that these experts point me to is we really just need to raise awareness. This isn't something that you even hear talked about, you know, at the Bachelor in Paradise finale you talked about. Um, so it is something that we do want to draw attention to, um, the mental health of these contestants. Dr. Akshay Sayal, thanks so much. Yeah. Siltycom, it's a big weekend for college football. The key matchups, the game, and the high stakes. Next. Well, our promise of a fun NFL-filled Thanksgiving delivered, but now the attention turns from the pros to college. Rivalry week heats up today, and there's definitely some Bad blood on the field tonight with Florida and Florida State, UCLA against Cal and North Carolina versus NC State. But all eyes are really on tomorrow, the game. Ohio State versus Michigan, number two versus number three, with the winner likely headed to the college football playoff. Nicole Auerbach is going to break down the key matchup. She's a senior writer for The Athletic. So, Nicole, break down this marquee Big Ten matchup here and what it means for the playoff. Yeah, well, it's basically being billed as a play-in game. Both of these teams are undefeated and have a really good chance to play for a national championship, and the other is standing in their way. So the winner of this game will go to the Big Ten Championship, will be a heavy favorite there, and likely to go on to the college football playoff. This game has not been this big since 2006 when both these teams met undefeated, ranked one and two in the country. Right now they're both in the top five. And we're in a situation here with Ohio State coming off a loss, and this is the first time in, in many years that that's been the case. It's only happened twice in the last few decades. So it's a very interesting storyline as Michigan tries to remain atop the Big Ten and back in the playoff. They made it for the first time last year. Well, that's not the only ranked game with huge implications for the playoff. An all-time classic rivalry, Southern California versus Notre Dame. What do the Trojans have to do to beat the Irish and keep their hopes alive? Well, they're going to need a, another magical performance from Caleb Williams. He has been phenomenal, probably playing better than everyone in the country, and is the current favorite to win the Heisman Trophy. He had over 500 yards of offense alone last week. Um, and for anyone who had not been staying up late to watch USC, I think they were introduced to what a special quarterback he is. And I think that's going to be the key. Notre Dame is going to be a much more challenging defensive uh, front and and just defense for USC to play. They have not been challenged like this all season long. Notre Dame, it's going to be more difficult for them to score and keep pace with USC. But that really, it's really going to come down to Caleb Williams and and what he's going to be able to do. USC, if they win out, will have a really good chance to make the college football playoff as well. Got about a minute left with you here, but there are five other playoff hopefuls still in the hunt. Georgia, Clemson, Alabama, TCU, and LSU. And even though they're all playing unranked teams, it's rivalry week. Anything can happen. So are any of these teams in real danger of losing and getting knocked out? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you to keep an eye on Clemson. And, and maybe this is not so much of a sneaky game anymore because we saw South Carolina beat Tennessee last week and they really throttled them and that was a stunner because Tennessee was another team that was lurking around the college football playoff picture and was ranked number one earlier in the season. South Carolina behind Spencer Rattler playing the best performance he's had all season comes out stuns Tennessee and now has a chance to knock another team out of college football playoff with Clemson which has been very dicey and and very inconsistent offensively so I think that could that is a game that has the potential to be an upset. All the other ones, uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about the favorites. All right, Nicole Arbach, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. And that's a wrap for this hour. We're going to have more for you here Monday, same time, same place. Hope all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Coverage picks up right now.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.